If you would, would you grab a Bible and open up your Bible to Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one, if you're gonna grab a Bible from the rack in front of you, it's on page 951, 951. We're gonna continue our study this morning in the book of Philippians. And up until this point in the book of Philippians, Paul has been writing about his own personal life circumstances. But now he is going to move from a personal update to a pastoral exhortation. This morning, Paul is going to exhort us. He is going to encourage us. He's going to instruct us with one serious, important, and comprehensive point. The exhortation is to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning, Paul is going to encourage us to live worthy. Chapter one, beginning in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Underline that. Underline it because that may be the main point in the whole book and for the whole book of Philippians. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. In 1998, the epic war film, Saving Private Ryan, was released to critical acclaim. So much was the acclaim that it was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and end up, ended up winning five Academy Awards. The movie, Saving Private Ryan, is directed by Steven Spielberg and it has an all-star cast that was led by Tom Hanks. An incredible movie. Amazing movie. It is intense. There are some intense battle scenes, but it is an amazing movie. The movie is set during the invasion of Normandy during World War II, and it is loosely based on a true story about the Ryan family. The father of the Ryan family had passed away, and the father and the mother, Ryan, had four children, and all four of their sons were sent off to battle in World War II. When the War Department learned that three out of the four Ryan sons were killed in battle, they decided that it would be appropriate to go find the remaining Private Ryan and return him home so his mother would have at least one son who survived the war. So the War Department enlists the help of Captain John Miller, who is played by Tom Hanks, and Captain Miller raises a, up a group of soldiers and leads this group of soldiers through the fields of Europe, scouring Europe, trying to find Private Ryan. And throughout their journey, they battle, they engage in numerous battles with German soldiers. It's as if they essentially fight their way to find Private Ryan. When they end up finding Private Ryan, he won't leave his unit until reinforcements arrive. But before the reinforcements arrive, they're assaulted by a superior force of German soldiers. And they engage in another battle, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And eventually, Captain Miller and his soldiers and the other units are victorious. They win. But most of them are killed or wounded. Look what happens. That's powerful. Captain Miller draws Private Ryan close. And he says, earn this. Earn this. In other words, recognize that there were men who died so that you might live.
this morning. It's as if the Apostle Paul is reaching out to you and to me and he's saying, earn this. Earn this. Recognize that there is someone who died so that you might live. Now, before we dig in, hear me. Paul is not saying, and I am not suggesting that there is some way that we can earn our salvation. Our salvation is a gift from God by this grace offered by and through our faith in Jesus Christ. There is no way we can earn our salvation. We don't deserve what Jesus did for us. That's not what Paul is saying. It's not what I am suggesting. But what Paul is saying to you and to me this morning is live your life recognizing that someone died for you so that you may live. Earn it. Earn this. So let's dig in and look at this challenge. Verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said it earlier, this is the theme of the book of Philippians. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting, the original Greek text actually begins with the Greek word for only. It's not in our NIV translation, but it is actually the first word that Paul uses in the original text. Our translation begins with whatever happens. It's also sometimes translated just one thing. Paul is saying here that whether he lives or dies, I have just one thing. Paul says he has just one thing to say. He has just one thing that he wants us to know. That is to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The Greek word that's translated conduct yourselves is literally live as citizens live as citizens. It's a word that likely meant a lot to the Philippians. Remember, Philippi is a Roman colony. And the members of the city of Philippi were mostly, were likely citizens of Rome. And these people were happy. They were proud of their Roman citizenship and they lived like Romans. They lived so much like Romans and they were so distinct from the people around them that they often referred to the people around them as, as being barbarians. To us this morning, Paul is saying that no matter where we live geographically, we are actually citizens of another place. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of heaven. So we should live differently than those who live around us, even differently than those who live around us in the United States. Our priority is to be our citizenship in heaven. And this is good instruction for many of us because there are some of us that hold our citizenship in the United States equal to our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to be clear. I am proud of my U.S. citizenship. I think personally that this on a sliding scale is the best country in the world. But what Paul is saying here is that there is to be a distinction between your citizenship in heaven and your citizenship in the United States or in any other country in this world. And the priority is to be your citizenship in heaven. And it shouldn't even be close. Your citizenship in heaven is to have greater priority than your citizenship in the United States. But this does not mean that you can stop paying taxes. (laughs) You still need to give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God. And what is God's is you because Jesus died on the cross for you. So God owns you. So give him all of yourself. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then notice it says we are to live worthy. To live worthy means 
that we are to live so that we live life giving it the proper weight as a result of what God has done for us. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, where he writes this, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Because Jesus died for you, because he died for me, we're no longer to live for ourselves, we are to live for Jesus. Another way to say it, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Look at how Eugene Peterson says it in his message paraphrase. He writes, live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Jesus Christ. What this means is that when people look at you, they should see Jesus. When people observe your lifestyle, they should immediately recognize that you are somehow different as a citizen of heaven Because you are a follower of Jesus Christ, they should see this difference. They should be able to see that you are conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Tony Morita and Francis Chan wrote this when they came to this verse of scripture. Believers are making a statement about the gospel, not only with their lips, but also with their lives. The gospel is about love. Therefore, we should be known as loving people. Please pay attention here. This is a really good quote. The gospel is about justice. Therefore, we should be justice-seeking people. The gospel is about life. Therefore, we should display visible vitality and joy in our gatherings and in our relationships. The gospel is about liberty. Therefore, we should not live as stuffy legalists. The gospel is about humility. Therefore, we should be a humble people gladly serving others. It's an excellent description of what it means to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Look how God puts it. This is what God says. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Is there any question in your mind that we live in a world that is full of injustice? Is there any question about that? We live in a world that is full of injustice. We live in a world where millions of babies are aborted annually. Millions are aborted before they are born. That is injustice. We live in a country where the color of your skin, where people of color face great prejudice and bigotry just because of the color of their skin, just because their skin is not white. That is injustice that is in the midst of us, is in our country. Human trafficking right here in West Michigan. Do you know West Michigan is one of the largest areas for human trafficking in the United States? People are being sold and bought to do horrible things. Our world is full of injustice, abortion, racism, human trafficking, just to name a few. So for you and for me, what are we doing? What are we doing to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God? And it's not easy. I recognize that it is difficult to follow Jesus Christ, to conduct ourselves in such a manner, to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul recognizes the difficulty that we have, so he identifies three ways in which we can walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Three ways. And the great thing about these ways is they are corporate in nature. We don't have to go through and do this alone. Three ways. First, we must stand firm together. We must stand firm together. Look at the second half of verse 27. Paul has an expectation that we stand firm Look what he writes. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit. 
This phrase, stand firm, describes a Roman military formation in which soldiers stood side by side and shoulder to shoulder. They gathered closely together and held their shields in front of them and their spears out in front of them as well. And they were so closely bound together that they were almost undefeatable and impenetrable because of this military formation. My friends, we need to realize that we are in a battle. Paul recognizes the battle. It's why he uses a military term to encourage us to stand firm. The surrounding culture, the culture around us has become more and more hostile to followers of Jesus Christ and to biblical truth. We need to stand firm together corporately. There's a tendency in many of us to to work, to act, to live individually. Some are lone rangers. Some people feel like they're alone. But the key here, the instruction is to work together as a community, standing firm together so that we're able to plant our feet, so that we're able to hold up our shield, so that our spears protrude, metaphorically speaking, of course. But the idea is standing firm together, recognizing that there is a battle raging around us. Stand firm together in one spirit. Paul starts with a military word. He then uses an athletic one. Look at the end of verse 27. Paul says, we must be striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. We have to start by standing firm together, but we need to do more than that. We must strive together. The word for strive can also be translated contending. Now, this is not a military phrase. It is actually an athletic phrase phrase. It's an image of a team working together in community to accomplish the task. Paul is a big advocate of teamwork. The idea is that we need to compete as a team to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not just unified for the sake of unity. We are put together as one for the purpose of advancing the gospel and winning. This means that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not to fight with each other. We're not to engage in battle with each other. It's so easy to get lost in the fight with each other and not recognize the battle outside. And I will tell you, this is one of Satan's best tactics. It's referred to as divide and conquer. If I divide the Christians, if if I divide them, if I keep them from being unified, I am going to be able to pick them off one by one and ultimately win the battle. It's what Satan does. If I had a dollar for every email I had to write this past year about masks, I would be a rich man. I cannot tell you how many emails I had to write about masks defending why we had this policy or that policy, some people encouraging us to wear masks forever, some people encouraging us to take them off. I wrote email after email, had discussion after discussion about masks. 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 I spent so much time on masks. And I know you people did too. But you see what happened? As I'm spending so much time on masks, what am I not spending doing? When you're fighting about masks, when you're discussing masks, what are you spending time doing? Talking about masks. You're not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not talking about the love of Jesus. You're not leading people towards faith in life in Jesus Christ because we're talking about masks. You all realize the absurdity, don't you? It's Satan's tactic. And Paul says, strive together. Some of my best memories of my kids growing up were the opportunities that I had to coach their sports teams. I loved coaching their sports teams. It can be said that I'm a bit overly competitive. The Lord is working on that in me, and I liked to win. And I realized early on that you could have the best athletes 
You could have the best basketball player or the best soccer player, but if they didn't work together as a team, you were not going to win. I look around Calvary Church and I think spiritually thinking, speaking, we have a lot of good athletes. But if we're not gonna work together, if we're gonna let Satan divide, we're gonna be conquered. Strive together. So we need to stand firm together in the one spirit. We need to strive together. There's a third instruction And that means we need to, and it is we need to live without fear, no fear. Verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Paul is incredibly direct here. It is very clear. There are going to be people who oppose us. There are going to be people who oppose us just because we are Christians, just because we are followers of Jesus Christ. People are going to oppose us. This phrase here speaks of being startled like a horse. A startled horse is going to take off running if it can. Christians living in a manner worthy of the gospel will never run away out of fear. We cannot let fear stop us or change how we live our lives for Jesus Christ. John Knox was a preacher during the 16th century. He was passionate for Jesus Christ and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. He lived under the reign of Mary I of England. She reigned from 1553 to 1558. She was the daughter of Henry VIII. She was referred to as Bloody Mary. She was referred to as Bloody Mary because she had 280 followers of Jesus Christ burned at the stake. And many of those burned at the stake were friends of John Knox. He faced great oppression from the throne, but in the midst of the oppression from the throne, he continued his passion in serving Jesus Christ and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at his funeral, it was said of him, here lies a man who never feared the face of man. Here lies one who never feared the face of man. My friend, you will never fear the face of any man if you fear God more than you fear man. If you fear God, there is no man you will ever be afraid of. Look at how Jesus says this. These are Jesus's words, okay? These are not Tom's words. They're not Paul's words. This is what Jesus says. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Now look at this next sentence. Jesus, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a choice, my friend. You can either be afraid of other people or you can be afraid of God. And if you are afraid of God, you will not be afraid of other people and you will live your life, you will conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not fear the man, the person who can kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can take your life and your soul. Paul gives us these three encouragements to live lives, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To stand firm, strive together, and don't be afraid. But as I was thinking about this, I think to myself, but what's in it for me? Like, what do I get out of this? I mean, it's kind of how we think. We think about this idea, the concept of self-interest. But Paul's saying, no matter what, do these things. And as Paul closes out this section, he gives us some more incentive to live worthy. He encourages us to recognize two ways, two things as we seek to walk worthy. Look at verses 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. 
Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This is further motivation to live worthy of the gospel of Christ. We have given, been given two gifts by God. Look at the first gift. It has been granted to you, to us, to believe in Jesus. Salvation is a gift from God. God has given you, he has granted you belief in Jesus Christ. Because of time, I'm not going to spend much time on this gift. We're not gonna dig any deeper. I think most of you get the idea, you recognize that your salvation is a gift from God. It's the second gift that's a bit more troubling. Now, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but suffering for Jesus is a gift from God. It's a privilege. It has been granted to you the opportunity to suffer for him. Do you remember uh, the story of Jesus rebuking Peter? What a story of Jesus rebuking Peter. Jesus is out preaching. He's teaching and he's sharing with the people who are listening to him that he must suffer many things. He has to go through many trials and many difficulties. Jesus is saying, I have to suffer. And not only am I going to suffer many things, but I'm then going to be taken to a cross and I'm going to be killed on that cross and I'm going to be placed in the ground, but then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Well, Peter, he doesn't like this story. He doesn't like this narrative very well. So he taps Jesus on the shoulder and he says, hey man, come over here, let's talk a little bit. And Peter begins to rebuke Jesus and says, no, that's not the way this works, Jesus. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to die. I got other plans. And Jesus says to Peter, Satan. He calls him Satan. Satan, get away from me. You see, at this point in the narrative, Peter doesn't understand the cross. He doesn't understand the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is the way of the cross. You see, we like to live our lives in comfort and ease and with pleasure. It's not Jesus's way. In fact, look at what Jesus does immediately after he rebukes Peter. Look what it says. Then he called a crowd to him along with his disciples. Now notice this. It's not just Jesus and his disciples. It's Jesus, his disciples, and the crowd. Jesus wants everybody to know this principle. He wants everybody to know this, his way. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you have read this verse numerous times in your life. You have heard this verse numerous times in your life, but because we are a thick-headed people, it often does not sink in what Jesus is saying to us here. Jesus is saying that my way is a way of the cross. It's not necessarily the path of pleasure. It's not necessarily the path of fun. It's not a path of ease. It's not a path of comfort, but it is a gift. I have given you this gift to follow in my way. Pick up your cross. Pick up your cross and follow me. It's been granted to you to believe, but it has also been granted to you to suffer for Christ. It's a gift. But you're thinking to yourself, how is that a gift? That's a gift that I want to return and get a store credit for. So here are some ways that I'd like to share that I think it, it further explains how this gift of suffering is actually a benefit to you and to me. First, it's a sense of assurance that we belong to Jesus. Suffering for Christ provides a sense of assurance that we belong to Jesus. This is verse 28 of chapter one. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, 
This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. When you face suffering, when you face persecution because you are a follower of Jesus, it is a sign to you. It is a sign that you belong to Jesus. And it is a sign not only that you belong to Jesus, that you are going to be saved and the person opposing you, the person persecuting you is not going to be saved and is actually going to go to hell. It is the message of this verse. You, when you experience suffering and persecution, it is assurance that you belong to Jesus. Second, it matures us. Suffering and persecution matures us. Look at what James writes. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Suffering for Jesus, trials of many kinds presents and provides you with maturity and completeness. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody who has experienced great persecution or suffering? do you notice that there's something about them? It's the maturity. They're actually more like Jesus because of the suffering, because of the trial that they've had to go through. And you end up feeling like, I'm talking to somebody here who really knows Jesus. It's an assurance that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that you belong to him, it matures us. And then thirdly, it increases our eternal reward. Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All throughout the Bible, there's story after story about followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ who are persecuted for the faith. And the promise is, is that your reward will be great your reward will be great as a result of experiencing, of suffering for Jesus. And fourthly, it reduces pride. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. The persecution in order to keep me from becoming conceited. Because when good things happen to us, we tend to think that we are causing all of those good things. When persecution and trial come, it keeps us from becoming conceited, which is closely linked to this next one. It keeps us from self-reliance. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So many times in our lives, we think we can accomplish whatever we set our minds to. Suffering and persecution reminds us that we are limited, finite creatures. And it causes us to turn our face towards God, the one who raises the dead. Next, it helps us share Jesus. We learned this a few weeks ago. Paul writes, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. His persecution, his being in jail for the sake of Jesus Christ has given him the opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then finally, it helps us minister to others. 2 Corinthians 1, verses three and four. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our persecution, God provides comfort for you and he provides comfort for me and he provides that comfort in the midst of our trial, difficulty, persecution, suffering, so that when we come across another person who is experiencing trial and difficulty and suffering and persecution, we can comfort them. Look at the list again. There is a gift of suffering that God gives to those who believe. 
It's a sense of assurance that we belong to Jesus. It matures us. It increases our eternal reward. It reduces pride. It keeps us from self-reliance. It helps us share Jesus and it helps us minister to others. And the interesting thing is these are not the rewards that people in our culture would value very highly. But ironically, it is these very rewards that come as a result of suffering and persecution, which leads to our joy. There is joy in the midst of suffering and persecution because, my friends, it is a gift from God. And out of it, he provides a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. The exhortation to you and to me this morning is to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand firm together, strive, contend for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid because we're all in it together, empowered by the spirit of God. As we close, I would like to remind you of one thing. You only have one life in which to do this. Jesus Christ died on a cross to give you life, the life that's provided through his gospel. And in that life, he has given you one life to live for him. One life. At the end of Saving Private Ryan, the last scene takes place 50 years after the battle in which Captain John Miller was killed. Check out the last scene. We watch those scenes and we get rightfully emotional. But ultimately, friends, we're gonna stand before a cross that has much, much more importance and priority than a cross in the middle of a field in Normandy. We're gonna stand before the cross of Jesus Christ, the one who died for you. Jesus is reaching out to you today and he's saying, recognize what I did for you. Recognize what I did and conduct yourself in a manner worthy of my gospel. Let's pray. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, seek us out online at calvarygr.org. On our website, you can also find an archive of previous messages from this series. Thanks for listening.